Um, so uh, I'm really happy to see all of you together. So as many of you know, I've been talking about deep learning uh, at least in the two previous uh, Gatsby meetings. Uh, and uh, my talks were full of uh, speculations and uh, wild, uh, wild assumptions that nobody <laughs> took seriously. But um, so I, I insisted on talking again because I think really that in the past year we we begin to have something like uh, something we deserve this title of a deeper understanding. But um, so okay, so this work started about four years ago with uh, one of the uh, ELSEC students, as many of you know, Noga Dostoevsky, and but eventually she moved to other things. She was more interested in, in language and other things she is doing now. And uh, most of the things I'm going to talk about are done together with Ravid, and to some extent also with Tomer, uh, all are ELSEC students. So, so, uh, so essentially, uh, I'm going to show you a, a, large, a large number of simulations, but uh, there's really some uh, theoretical uh, breakthrough, if you want, uh, which we achieved really re recently, and which justified the whole approach and I, I'm calling it rethinking uh, large-scale learning theory. Essentially, the basic argument I'm going to of course, go into detail is that the classical uh, learning theoretic uh, bounds, which are based on properties of what we call the hypothesis class, I mean, what, what kind of functions can be learned, uh, and, 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 and all sorts of uh, covering of the hypothesis class using things like the VC dimension of the class or other similar uh, complexity bounds are essentially irrelevant as far as I'm concerned today with uh, what happens in deep neural networks. So the first part is really trying to convince you that this is true, that you really need to re rethink uh, learning theory and get some very different types of bounds. And then I'm actually going to argue that uh, the standard way that deep learning is, is, uh, is trained today, which is what we call stochastic gradient descent or back propagation or whatever you want to call it, is uh, actually leading to opt optimal solutions of the type that nobody ever considered uh, for neural networks. Uh, and essentially the more important part of the training is not uh, fitting the data or what we call the empirical risk minimization or fitting the training data but rather something completely different, which is compressing the input representation. And uh, this is done by essentially the noisy part of the stochastic gradient descent. So this is the first and probably the only message I will be able to deliver here today. <laughs> so let me start. So I, d I doubt there is anyone here who doesn't know what deep learning is. I'm going to, <coughs> just for the, to make sure that you all know. So neural networks is a very old idea that, that was born essentially in the 40s by the the model of McCulloch and Pitts, and then was proposed as a model for pattern recognition by Rosenblatt uh, in the 50s, early 60s, and then was essentially killed by Minsky and Papad in the famous or infamous book called Perceptrons, which is essentially an, an attempt to, to argue that deep neural network in the sense that Rosenblatt thought about them in many, many layers and eventually a perceptron is something that will never work, and they have a beautiful perfectly rigorous book and completely wrong as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's essentially came to the conclusion with a lot of very insightful theorems about invariances and, and what can and what can't be learned with linearly separable thresholds and so on. But eventually the main conclusion that Rosenblatt's multi-layer idea will <laughs> never work is completely wrong. By the way, Minsky, just recently, I mean, two years ago, <laughs> repeated the same arguments. And, you know, some people never learn. Anyway, <laughs> what they really missed there, <laughs> yeah, what, what they really missed there is that uh, there's a chain rule of derivatives, which can actually allow us to propagate the error through the layers. But we'll come back to this. In the 80s, the whole idea was reborn again through the PDP work of Rumelhard, Hinton, Williams, and others. Uh, and uh, so this is essentially was the new or the second phase of connectionism. That's when, when many of us, uh, including me, started to get interested in neural networks. In the early 80s, it happened together with Hopfield models and many other important things for us. Uh, and actually also with the beginning of machine learning, uh, 
I mean, if you, if I, I really consider the beginning of modern machine learning by the, this historical paper of Les Valiant on the theory of the learnable, which actually stated for the first time in 1982 the, the bounds that I'm going to modify today. Okay, and then uh, came Vapnik, Vladimir Vapnik, who essentially killed the basic idea of multi-neural neural networks for about 10 years using support vector machines, kernel nets, with many other things which were extremely nice mathematically and pushed away neural networks for a while. But then Hinton and Lecun and a few others insisting, <laughs> insistive guys eventually brought it back in around 2008, 2009 where they showed that if you extend the notion of neural network from few layers to many hidden layers, that's why they call it deep, uh, you actually perform eventually, if you train it long enough on enough data, you perform better than any other known model at the time. And this remained the case since then, essentially, or even more, uh, on certainly all pattern recognition problems that we know in computer vision, in speech recognition, lang language understanding, in computational biology, in autonomous driving, whatever you want. I mean, essentially everything, it's not everything, of course. Shai is going to tell us something about what it can't do but I'm actually interested in why it works. So, okay, so this is something I, told, I said many years ago, I'm going to skip this. So essentially, the whole idea of connecting, connecting neural nets as an information theory <coughs> comes from the very nat natural structure of the problem. I mean, what we have here is one variable, which I call the input variable, and for the sake of this talk, think about pixels of an image or something like this. So this is a high dimensional random variable, it's random because I'm looking at many images there is some distribution. And uh, so this is high entropy variable. And usually we have a low entropy variable which can be even one bit, which is the label, something like is there a face in the image or is it done or not or something like this. And uh, I mean these are of course very complicated, qu simple questions but the answer is highly distributed. I mean, there's no one bit in the, in the image that tells me if it's done or not, or one pixel. It's highly distributed in the axis. That's really the key feature of, of the, those learning problems. And of course, what the deep neural network is doing, essentially moving through, so we all know what the neurons are, I don't have to explain it, essentially it's a cascade of transformations, which we call the, the hidden layers. Each one is just a function of the previous one. I'm ignoring for this talk all other variations on this theme, with with recurrent connection or with uh, feedback or whatever it is. At this point, I'm really talking about the plain vanilla deep learning. So there's a cascade of hidden layers, which are function of, each one is a function of the other, of course, after training. So I can think about it as, as, as about them as random variables, which are forming a mark of chain. So these arrows are actually indicating statistical dependency. Each one depends only on the previous one. And uh, eventually, at the end, the last hidden layer should generate an approximation of the output, which I call y hat. Okay, so eventually it should cap. So, so all those internal representation or hidden layers are some sort of internal representations of the, of the variable x. Okay, so to make a long story short, I, I also going to skip this. Is there anybody here who doesn't know what mutual information is? <laughs> Just to make sure that you know. So I actually need two functions that I'm going to use all the time. One of them is the KL divergence which is a non-negative measure of similarity. It's not a metric between two distributions. It actually has a very nice uh, information theoretic interpretation. It's the axis of the code loss if you, of a mismatch coding. If I, if I code the distribution Q by a code, a distribution P by a code generated by Q and so on. And it's, and, and, and it's also the generator of all the other functions of information theory, in particular the mutual information, which is just the cross entropy between the joint and the product of the marginals. So it's zero, of course, if they're independent, and I can rewrite it as the difference between the entropy of x and the conditional entropy of x given y. Okay, mutual information is a fundamental quantity, and I'm going to use it again and again. Here I just want to mention two properties. One of them is what we call the data processing inequality, which is the fact that if you go along a Markov chain, <coughs> information cannot increase. So essentially the information between x and z cannot be larger than the information in X and Y. It's an obvious property if you read Cover first chapter. And the other one, which is not as often mentioned, is the fact that mutual information is completely invariant to reparameterization. So as long as I'm having an invertible function phi and psi, 
any transformation, permutation, whatever, non-invertible non transformation is not going to change the mutual information. That's actually something some people don't like, but we actually find it very, very powerful. So, okay, I'm going to skip this. So essentially, the, the, key, po the key property of the layers of neural network are these two chains of data processing inequalities. So essentially, the information within the, the layer i and x is always left in the entropy of x, which is the information between x and x, if you want. And, uh, and it's always decreasing along the chain. So I have uh, one chain of inequalities, and of course, the information between x and y, which is the relevant information in the image, how much x is actually telling me about y. In the best case, it's just the entropy of y, but it's not always the case. <laughs> you can have stochastic maps, but it's always, there's always another chain of inequalities that also always decreases. So this is already allowing me to think about, well, actually, so here comes the, the, the really fundamental theorem of the topic. So essentially, I want to think about a neural network as an encoder of x, so the t, the i's layer, which is here I denote by t, but never mind, that t and h are equivalent to that. Thing. So the, the, the i's layer is some function of the input which I call the encoder. I mean, so it can be a stochastic function of the input. This is an encoder of the layer t. And there is another, a decoder associated with it, which is how the label is predicted from the, this layer. Essentially, my, my first, not entirely trivial statement, is that for large typical x's, I mean, so x is large enough that I can apply the typicality arguments of information theory, and for those who don't know what I'm talking about, I'll remind you in a second. Uh, the only thing that really matters as far as the property of this encoder and decoder is the mutual information between the input and the layer, which completely governs the, the complexity in terms of how many examples you need in order to train it. And, uh, and the accuracy or the generalization error of the network is completely determined by the information that the representation is given about the output. And essentially, if I talk about, think about the whole neural network, it's the last hidden layer which really determines everything. It determines how much, how many examples you need, as well as how accurate your prediction is going to be. So this is, this is what I call the information plan theorem. It's the justification really to look only at these two numbers, the mutual information between the input and the layers, and the, the mutual information between the layer and the output. Now, I'll give you some hints about this, the proof of this theorem. So, complexity, do we, do we, do we need a uh, definition of that, or just make this a number? Complexity? complexity yes. I never mentioned this name. So ah, the complexity, the sample complexity, you mean? Sample complexity is the number of examples on average that you need, okay? That's uh, essentially how much you can achieve with a certain number of data points. And we are thinking about random examples. Is it You'll see in a minute. Yeah, you are right. But okay, so I, you know, b b without further ado, I want to show you. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's the number. It's what we call the the the, the unusual in, le in learning theory. The number of examples needed for essential generalization error. No, yeah, no, the number of examples is determined by IXT and the precision, epsilon, <laughs> how well you are doing in terms of predicting the label is determined by ITY. That's what I'm saying. I'm going to give you some insight to exactly why it's true. So essentially, I, I, I now want just be, I'm going to show you a movie that some of you have seen before. So what you see here is this information plan. The x-axis is the, the mutual information of the layer to the input. And the uh, y-axis is actually, in, in, instead of log 2, it's log ln e, so it's one bit, but 0 0.7, never mind that. Uh, it's the mutual information of the label to the, to the same layer. And the different colors here are different layers in a, a six-hidden layer neural network. It's a very specific neural network which we started to play with. Eventually, since then, we tested it on many, many other architectures. It's not very important. So what? What you see here is the initial condition of 50 different networks. So every one of those balls is a layer of one of those networks. And essentially what you see here, this line is, the, is one instantiation of one network out of 50. Now I'm going to show you how they evolve when you do this stochastic gradient descent. The color, the color code is the other different layers. So this is the last hidden layer. This is one before, one before, and so on. 
It's, it's the two fundamental quantities, the information on the input and information on the output. It's one variable, it's not one neuron, the whole layer with respect to the whole, to the whole input. So let me show it again. I know it was too fast. It's actually quite uh, fascinating when you look at it many times. Notice that, of course, you start with a very fast dropout of information. And of course, Chaim will tell me this is not always true. Of course, this is true only and when you actually shrink the dimension of the layers and you really lose information. Probability that a random map will actually keep, not keep the information is very small. So notice again what happens here. I mean, I, it ran too quickly. So essentially, everything up to this point, this is what I call the fitting phase, the, ne the ne neurons essentially climb up, they move more or less to the diag diagonal of this plane, and here they more or less stop, and then you start to see very, very slow motion, which improve the generalization, improve, but also highly move left in terms of compressing the representation. So that's a fascinating observation that we really, I, I believe that something like this must happen, but until we read actually shows us the simulation, we didn't know that. So essentially, what I argue, so first of all, and note by the way, that each one of those networks is an entirely different network. There are different initial conditions and different order of examples. So, and there's actually very little correlation between the neurons in the same layer across those different 50 networks. So they, they look like the same point here, but they're very, very different networks. Now, so let me show you just again to, to amplify the effect. This is the average over those 50 points. So you see essentially what, what happened to one, one network. It starts very slowly with very low information. And then so you see first, you see that those traces that you barely see, but you see that first it climbs up, more or less to the diagonal. This is what I call the ERM phase or the, the drift phase. I'll show you sure in a minute why. And then, okay, so up to this point, essentially you get an improvement in the, what you expect. I mean, the training error goes down and nothing spe spe specifically happened to the information about X. But from this point on, something rather, rather dramatic happened. Most of the epochs, it's about 90% or 95% of the epochs, are actually spent on the higher uh, trajectories here. So you see, they get the number of SGD epochs. And you see this very, very slow compression to the left, which means that the representation, each of the layers separately, keeps less and less information about the input while maybe slightly decrease the information about the label. So in this case, there's a slight loss of relevant information, but in general, it stays pretty high. No, yes? No, I care actually about the information of all of them, but I, I actually argue that it's only the last layer that determines the true, the true uh, number of examples. No. T. That's the last layer? That's the last layer. No, 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 no. The this is the input layer. Input it is here, output is here. Okay, then the, the first layer has all the information all the time. Nothing changed there. It's the other layers that do the work. Okay, so essentially what I'm going to... First of all, it's, it's a very nice visualization. I hope you agree with me. It's some sort of an x-ray of the network. It's really telling us something about what's really happening inside in a way that nobody else has you know, shown before. But it's also, of course, given putting an answer, a question, what's actually the reason for this? I mean, I'm only doing gradient descent here, stochastic gradient descent, sort of the mini batches, and uh, no other thing, no regularization, no uh, sparsification, no, no dropout, whatever, all those nice hacking which people use, not, nothing like this is, happen, is used, used here, yes. So things go up and then go less? More or less. Yeah, you're going to get very, very poor generalization. If you stop here, the last layer has about half of the information that you need. No, no, they, they already went all the way up. And then you don't... Okay, good question. So I'm going to show you another movie, uh, which is the same movie, but this time I, I plot it actually with the train and test errors during the training. So what you see here are the test and training test in green and, 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 and train in, in red. And first of all, you see that there's, there's really hardly any, any overfitting. I mean, they really follow each other very, very nicely. And if you notice, the beginning of what I call the compression phase 
is right at the knee where the training error essentially saturates. Okay? So you see the training error still goes down, and you see there's actually still an improvement, not much improvement, there's still an improvement in generalization through this compression. Almost none. Almost none. Okay, I'll show you other examples. So here, after about 2000, here you can argue the compression didn't help you much, but I can show you other examples where it actually does most of the work. Early stopping. stopping. Yeah. So I'll, I'll come back to early stopping in a second. Okay, just let me. I, I really have a lot of material and only half of my time is gone. So, so essentially, what I'm saying. Why is this in this moment? Oh, yeah. So, essentially, so you saw this movie. I, I want to go back to theory. So, just the classical generalization bounds, for those of you who know them, looks something like this. The usually epsilon square is smaller than the log of the cardinality of the hypothesis class. And actually, in general, we have to think about an epsilon cover of the cardinality of the Boson class. I mean, I, it can be infinite, but if we have a finite cover, such that two hypotheses have a, at least, at, at, at most epsilon uh, error mismatch between, between them, it's good enough. So that's really the trick that we use in, in learning theory all the time, plus something which depends on the confidence, forget about it, divided by the number of examples. That's essentially the structure of all generalization bounds in learning theory. There are all sorts of very interesting variations, but essentially the same structure. Now, so this is just to be clear about what is known. Usually what we assume or we can prove that there is an epsilon cover of the hypothesis class which scales like 1 over epsilon to some dimension. And this dimension is like the household dimension, if you want, or like the VC dimension. This is essentially how the cover size scales with epsilon. And uh, if I plug this here, I get indeed D over M. As the, as the dominant factor in terms of the generalization, okay? Now, uh, as I say, I think that Chai will agree with me, these bounds don't seem to work for deep learning. I mean, they don't give us tight enough or anything close to tight enough bounds if I just try to estimate the basic dimension of the class. I mean, anything like the number of weights, or you know, there are many expressivity, new expressivity results that they can actually express even larger, much larger classes of functions I, I, I tend, I actually argue that these type of bounds are in what in the stratosphere, as I call it. I mean, they're very, very high. They don't even get close to a bound on the arrow that we see. And the fact is that we actually can train those networks with almost no overfitting, even with much fewer examples than anything gets as close to the dimension of the network. So we need another type of bound. Just a second. So I'm just trying to remind you. So what I, 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 there's a new type of bound that I call the, the input compression bound. So think about x again as a random variable which has entropy. And as all of you should know, the size of x is typically, using the typical typicality argument as it's equal partition property of information of entropy, essentially the, the two to the number to the entropy of x. This is essentially the number of points, and this is the only thing it's, which is hard, but it's not mine, it's channel. This is this is the argument that essentially typical x's are uniformly distributed, and this is one of this is the probability, and this is the number essentially. Now, if I co if I compress the input, which means I divide the input into into pieces, instead of epsilon bounding the hypothesis class, I do something much simpler. I epsilon bound the input class, which means I divide the input into cells, covering cells. I didn't have enough energy to cover all of it into cells which have enough, uh, which are much smaller. And then, okay, then I know already just from, from basic information theory that typically the size or the average size of this cell, which I want to call an epsilon cover of the input for a second, is due to the conditional entropy of X over the cover. So think about the layer of the network T as inducing a partition of X. And this is the typical size of a partition given T. Now, this means that the number of cells, essentially the ratio of these two things, which is two to the emission information, of course, okay? So again, this leads immediately to this type of bound. So I replace, I bound the a, J epsilon not by the structure of the hypothesis class, but the, by the quantization of the input. So if, input, if the input X is full, I mean, I can't compress it, then H of epsilon is bounded by two to the X. I'm talking about Boolean function. No, never mind. So, and then, of course, if I plug 2 to the x in this bound, I get nothing. I, mean, I get that essentially m is, has, has to be the size of x, which is no generalization. 
but if I can actually compress the input, I can improve the generalization. The number of functions goes to 2 to the, the cover size, which is, uh, which is, as I said, is much smaller. But this, of course, depends strongly on the assumption that I can cover the input, so I can put spheres of partitions on the input such that the probability of misclassification within itself is very small. Okay? Epsilon. Okay, and then I, I just plug T epsilon as 2 to the initial information and plug this double exponent there and I get that this, this, the typical bounds move to, instead of being dimension over M, they're being 2 to the information over M. There are two logs here. T to the epsilon is 2 to this, and H is 2 to this. <laughs> it's a double exponent. And this double exponent, one of the logs is killing one of them, but not both of them. And you are remaining with a 2 to the information bound. So this, this actually has a dramatic implication. I mean, if you actually, if I can compress the input by k bits, I actually improve, this is equivalent, more or less, to a factor of 2 to the k, a factor of 2 to the k on the examples. Okay, so, so this is dramatic. This is a very different type of bound. Yes. The T, T epsilon is, is what? The, induced by the T layer. Yeah, that's what's going to be. So any layer is essentially an injective. It's the compression of the input into the one realization of the, of the layer, and you can think about the inverse map as a partition of X. Okay? So that's very simple, extremely simple. Actually, I was surprised that nobody said it before. But, uh, but this is enough to, to, uh, to justify the importance of the compression. I mean, essentially, every bit that the layers move to the left here is a factor of two in terms of influence on generalization, in terms of examples of dimension, if you want. Okay, so that's why, that's my claim. That's only part of, half of the story. The second half is, of course, that I, I need to guarantee that the cover is an epsilon cover. If it's not epsilon cover, then the whole bound is wrong. In order to guarantee this, I need enough points in every partition to actually, using standard convergence of means, of empirical means, bounds, I need somehow to guarantee that uh, my, my uh, cells are indeed epsilon covered. So, but this is just a constant factor in terms of D over epsilon. Okay, so what is an epsilon cover? An epsilon cover is a cover of your, 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 your object with spheres which are not larger than epsilon. Okay? That's a cover. In this particular context, the, the distance, the distortion that I'm using, is, is, it depends on the, on the label. So actually using this scale divergence between the true empirical estimate of the label from the data and the label predicted by the centroid of this partition. So essentially, why is this uh, true that I need only two to the t? Because actually I need one example in every partition, and that's enough. Because this, I'm going to use this piecewise constant function as an approximation to a function. Think about it as a sampling theorem. I mean, so essentially, what should be the density of the samples you know, to actually approximate the function well? Yes, I, I know I'm not going to get very far like this. But yeah. Yeah, that's great. How you do it? Oh, yeah, that. Okay. If you can do this, then you finish the problem. Okay. No, 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 no. Okay, okay, good. No, no. Of course, in principle, let's say this image with pixels, if I could somehow split all, that, all, the, all the images that are, have has it done in it from those that are not, then I, saw I don't need the deep learning, I don't need anything. Okay? So this is just a solution. Obviously, there is a partition like this, but it's very complicated. But what I'm saying is that... This, okay, so we'll come back to this, of course. So I'm saying if there is an epsilon cover, an epsilon can be very large or very big, if there is, and actually this is a condition for deep learning to work, then all I need to do is to make sure that... Okay, so I just want to convince you that this scale divergence, first of all, it bounds the true error. This is a very famous bound which... Uh, known for years, this is called the, the Pinsker bound, according to Shai, and, and, this is, uh, and this is something which you need here. So then we know that the average distortion of the size, this is another thing that I know, because x is a function, uh, t is a function of x, then this average distortion or average sphere size is simply the difference between distribution information, and that's why 
if I can bound the mutual information of the layer, this one, they actually bound the distortion and therefore it has a bound. And then we have something which we know for a long time, since uh, Ohad Shamir and Sivan worked with me on this, and that we know that the information itself is bounded, the empirical information cannot be too far from the true information in a way which looks like this number of clusters, the number of uh, partitions divided by square root of number, for example. This is a classical, uh, classical application of the, of the uniform convergence bounds. So I can, we can do this. This actually, this bound originally was shown by Paninsky, but it's all right. So, uh, so we know that we can, uh, if I just compress by, by this uh, KL divergence, I actually get a good, I can guarantee, and we actually know, okay, so in this information plan, I'm going to skip this because I said it many times already, there is an optimal line beyond which I'm not, uh, there are no representations. This looks like very much like a very distortion function. It's actually, I call it the information bottleneck limit. There I cannot go above this line. Of course, in the examples I showed you, the line was very high, but I cannot go above this line. And this red line is this bound, essentially. So what it tells you that the best that you can do is actually come close to the maximum of this bound. This is where you want your last layer to be. Okay, so I know that you didn't get all of this, but never mind. So here is, again, just the gist of the story. So what you see here are those three information plane pictures for the same network, six layers, the same problem. This is with 5% of the training data, so it's under-trained. And this is with 85% of the data. It's a finite problem, the only 4,096 4, 4, patterns with 12 bits of inputs. And uh, so everything is completely finite, and uh, Ravid could do, th could do this estimation of information with no problem, just counting. Think about all the layers as binary variables. They're not. We actually quantize them, and we bin them, but we, have, we know how to do it. So this is a good estimation. And what you see here, again, are those trajectories as a function of the epochs. And you see that when you under-train, actually the compression is actually taking you down. You see that the last epochs here, instead of improving the information on generalization, actually go down. So this is the classical overfitting, and that's precisely where, under, where early stopping helps. You're, you're avoiding this uh, fall. But if you have enough data, this is about 40% of the data, this is high enough, then the compression is actually improving the generalization. How much time do I have? So essentially what I'm arguing is that right at this green line, which I call it, is the phase transition between the, the fast drift phase and the compression phase, something quite dramatic happens to the gradients of the stochastic gradient descent. And that's really the neat part of the story. Let me skip all these. Yeah. So essentially, this is an, another key figure to this story. What you see here, as a function of the number of the epochs, this is our network. And as I said, I mean, it's actually tested on many other networks, inclu including real world problems and large problems and, CN and CNNs and whatever you want. And values, whatever, everything, doesn't matter. So essentially, this is the network we use here. And what you see here are the mean of the gradient and the standard deviation of the gradients across epochs, across, across the batches of every epoch. So the batches are many, many batches are, essentially I don't take all the examples, I take only parts of them, and there is a situation between along the batches. So this is the standard deviation along, along the, the batches, the mini batches, and this is the mean of the gradient. And what is really striking, of course it took us some time to really plot it like this, but that's correct. This is in a log-log scale. You see this right at the beginning, the gradient is very high, it's very stable, and the fluctuations are very small. There are three orders of magnitude difference here, which means that, which is what I call, I call the high signal to noise regime. The, the gradients are sharp, they know exactly where they are going, and then at some point something quite remark remarkable happens. This is exactly the point where the training error saturates. So essentially you fit the data. And then the means of the gradients go down, but the fluctuations really jump up. And after this point, the signal-to-noise ratio of the gradients is much higher, much lower, which means the fluctuations are much higher than the mean. Which means that essentially, this is again, two orders of magnitude difference, essentially the gradients look like noise. It's not really noise, because from time to time they have to correct you and bring you down back to the relevant, the relevant component of the input. So it's a corrected or constrained random walk. Notice something quite remarkable, which again we saw only in the simulation. The difference between the colors, the, the standard deviation to the mean, 
which is just the log of the ratio, is a constant, is approaching a constant, which means that the signal to noise ratio of every layer in terms of the gradient is approaching a constant. So this cannot be a coincidence. We actually find it in all the networks. Or for all the layers, they are not the same, but they approach ratios constant. Ratio signal to noise ratio, constant ratio signal to noise ratio means something like constant capacity. And indeed, this, this is what I believe happened. By the way, so this is a, a general phenomenon. This is an entirely different rule. This is the committee machine. You see the same trajectories, I mean, going up and going left, and the same flip, the same phase transition in terms of, you know, terms of the gradients. And this, if you don't believe that this is, if this is a too small problem, Ravid actually proved this, showed it also for, for the handwriting, MNIST handwriting digital recognition. This is the CNN uh, convolutional neural network with uh, ReLU's activations with some regularization, with the Adam <laughs> regularization. This is one single network, by the way, no averaging. You see how well the, the problem gets larger, you get exactly the same phenomenon. This is average over 15 or something networks. And again, you get this fast, rapid uh, convergence to the diagonal, more or less, and then very slow, very slow compression. And notice something which is also remarkable, that the layers tend to converge to some points. They don't all compress. They stay more or less equally apart. But the last layer doesn't show anything. This is the last layer. No, the first layer doesn't show anything. No, but the last layer is actually doing this. Well, it's doing something like this. But in, in this case, actually, the compression, it starts compressed and it ends up compressed. It started more or less at three and a half bits, which is what you need. So it doesn't matter. I mean, this just means that the last layer is small enough to capture the information. You couldn't get much further here because there's not, there are not enough data, there are not, there are not enough un units there. If you increase the width of the layers, you actually see that. And here, again, by the way, we, we looked at the, at the gradients and you see exactly the same phenomena. Very high signal to noise regime and then a low signal to noise regime, which is exactly where the compression occurs. Okay, so now I, I, I'm really out of time. So I just want to show you how it explains, among other things, why the hidden layers help you. So this is uh, the same problem, this uh, spherical symmetric problem, never mind that, uh, with one hidden layer, two hidden layers, three and so on, and up to six hidden layers, trained on the same data. And what you see here is, is again, quite striking. I mean, with one hidden layer, you eventually fit the rule, but it takes essentially forever. I mean, after 10,000 epochs, I hardly get to good representation. Although, in principle, it can learn the rule. I know it can learn the rule because I have a layer, I have a network like this, so one hidden layer should be enough. When you start increasing the number of hidden layers, let's say all the way here, you see that it should become eventually blue or dark blue, which means that I converge to such a high good representation very, very quickly. Okay, that's very nice, which means somehow remarkably, when adding more layers, the whole compression process is, is boosted. Now, okay, so here, yeah, what's question? No question. So essentially, this is one of those uh, nice things that when you have something true, and usually it tends to, uh, tend to explain things that you didn't think about. So essentially, what I argue, okay, so for, so first of all, the transition again is this uh, phase transition between the phases of the gradients happens exactly in the same location, by the way. No matter, almost doesn't matter where, how many examples you have. It essentially goes to the diagonal of this, of this and, and, and it calls for a theory, and I have a, some beginning of a theory why it happens right there, but, uh, but oh, most of the story is really in the compression. And as I said, I mean, it, it boosts the representation, it avoids the overfitting, and it also tells us something very interesting about the organization of the layers. So here, here I'm more in the, still in the, in the mist in terms of theory, but I, I just want to, okay, by the way, so this is again one of the, the punchlines. We know now that the layers, so these are the layers of this network, they eventually converge to the bound, to the optimal bottleneck bound. What you see here are essentially the location of the, of the hidden layers with the estimated information bottleneck. Notice here that I, we stretched the information from 0 0.98 to 1, very high, but uh, so essentially, there's a slight compression, there's a slight uh, loss of information, which we actually see, but they all converge eventually to this highly compressed point. By this highly compressed point, actually the most random one. 
Okay, so let me just give you the, my basic intuition about how, why it happens. So essentially there are two, two explanations. One of them is that the stochastic gradient descent, which we can think of as some sort of a stochastic relaxation, I mean I have the, a change of the weight proportional to minus the gradient of the error, plus noise. Now this noise usually is, as I said, is, is the result of the training uh, mini batches, but uh, I can think about it for all practical purpose as an independent noise because I have a, enough of them. And these type of equations, as we all know, or we all should know, eventually converge to an exponential distribution or maximum entropy distribution in the error, error or energy or whatever you used to call it. So this is a classical result in statistical physics, which I actually learned <laughs> from Heim, but, but I knew it before that. And, <laughs> and of course, it, we're using it all the time. So imagine what's actually happening. So I add noise to the weights. The weights are doing some sort of a, of a, a random walk or a winner processing, if you want, and eventually fill up the space. Now, if they fill up the space, they increase the joint entropy of X and T, but the entropy of X is six. So essentially what they increase is the conditional entropy of X on T. Or in some sense, they, they, they widen the partition as much as possible without increasing the turning error. Now, Okay, so if you believe this, since we know that the information bottleneck bound is actually a maximum entropy, it's a minimum information bound, which is maximum conditional information, given the training error, then we understand why it happens. I mean, stochastic relaxation can do it, but then here I'm doing something which is not entirely complete. So if you think about stochastic relaxation, think about diffusion, for example. Diffusion is a special case like this. Diffusion process starts, let's say, with a delta function, and then grows like a Gaussian. Simple diffusion. <laughs> in any dimension, grows like a Gaussian, the width of the Gaussian grows like square root of t, as you all know, and I hope, and, and of course the entropy is the log of the width, more or less, so the, the number of steps it's take, it taking to increase the variance is exponential in the, in the width. That's what I believe is a general phenomenon, although I don't have, there can be all sorts of, 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 uh, of uh, variations on this theme, of course. So in some sense, in all the, what happens when you compress all the layers together, all of them are doing random walks. You simply divide this compression of one big compression that one hidden layer has to do into k compressions, each one separately. And this, of course, in terms of times, moves me from exponent of the sum of those compressions to the sum of the exponents. And this is huge. Essentially, it's exponential. In, if I am right, it's an exponential boost in time. So this gives you some idea what happens there. The other one has to do with capacities. I'm going to skip it. Essentially what I'm arguing is that only the relevant information goes through and eventually you compress the capacity. Let me just show you one movie and you have to stop me at some point. Yeah, now. But, uh, now, yeah, okay. Because <laughs> I can go forever. I just want to show you one more movie. One more movie. So essentially what I'm saying is that the, noise, the noisy part of the gradient is wiping the irrelevant information in the input. It's a, and one way of thinking about it, you think about, let's say the, let's say the input is a sound, and I care only about one frequency, or one, one frequency band. This is the only thing which is relevant. So essentially what should happen is that this, the information in, within this frequency band eventually goes through all the layers, and all the others are somehow suppressed. So we can check it directly, and Tomer actually did such experiments, and what you see here, and he is not going to interfere, I hope, because it's not exactly what we should do. What you see here is the relevant information in the different channels of, of frequency, in some sense, as a function of the training, and that's what happens across the neurons of different layers. And you see that the irrelevant part, which is the yellow part, is eventually going down, and the relevant component, and you can all guess which one it is, it's number four, uh, is actually coming up, and eventually, during the compression, here, this is the, again the information plan, during this compression phase, essentially all the irrelevant information is suppressed, and what you see that get, get to the last layer is only the relevant information. So that's very nice. The story is simply that the noise in the gradient filters out by reducing the signal to noise ratio to irrelevant of the irrelevant channels. So now I have a more or less a complete story in the sense that I know how gradient descent can, can do the trick. We have some clue about the organization of the layers. By the way, those of you asking what happens to the phase transition that I was talking about last year, 
are still there, by the way. If there are phase transitions along the curve, they're going to be through critical slowing down to slow this diffusion, and eventually I'm going to get stuck there. But in many problems, this is not important. Okay, so this is uh, essentially my story. I had uh, many, many other consequences, which I don't have time to describe. So let me just summarize. So anyway, first of all, we get a very nice visualization. Second, we understand that the advantage of the layer is mostly computational, and we more or less understand why it happens. And there uh, are many, many details that, and further directions. For example, what one thing we can now ask, actually, and I'm actually writing a, a research proposal just on this, is we can actually study how much each layer is specialized for a given input and actually see how much can be learned because I can take as, as my distribution not one law but a whole hypothesis class. So I can really ask this question of transfer learning or how much of the layer are really specific and how much are not specific, how much I can move from one layer to the next and many, many other questions. One of them is actually quite bad news for neuroscience as far as I'm concerned. This is actually what happens to the neurons. Okay, I should start from the beginning. So it's the same picture, but here I'm looking at the information in each, each neuron in the layer on the output. So first of all, it's a beautiful movie. Oh, I'm sorry. It's really uh, one of those things that Ravid showed me when I said, aha. Uh -huh. Okay. So you see again the neurons of the, the last layers, and you see that in the, in the original, in the middle, in the lower layers, there's the information is highly distributed. The neurons are doing crazy things. And eventually, when they come to the compression phase, all the last, the last <laughs> neuron layers start to migrate to the left, <laughs> as I expect. And the one, all of them follow them somehow. You see the first layer, the second layer, and so on. But what is really striking, and then, of course, the, the lower layers hardly change. So all this, this is the red, the lower layer. Actually, the information is spread over, along the layers in a very uniform way, and that's the next one, this next one. But this is the top layers. Essentially, all the layers are telling you essentially the same story, which really means that the information is highly distributed. I mean, so I, I take out of it something which many of you will not agree, of course, is that all this interpretation of a grandmother cell, or, you know, this is a face cell, and this is a, a mouse cell, and this is an eye cell, in deep neural networks, I'm not talking about the brain, uh, is, is, is nonsense. I mean, I really don't believe it. I mean, as long as you train it with stochastic gradient descent, train it again, you'll see something completely different. So essentially, all the neurons somehow distributed, move this relevant information in distributed ways through all of them. Let's stop here. <laughs>